very much because it's very long. Um, but the overture is probably the most famous opera overture that was ever written, uh, originally from its use as the Lone Ranger theme. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then, in 1829, he quit writing operas um, for the rest of his life, and he lived a long time. He lived almost 40 years longer. Um, he never really explained to anyone, whoever wrote it down, why he did this. It's, the, the many reasons have been proposed. One is that he was uh, naturally kind of lazy, and he had, he had money beyond all dream and imagination anyway, so why bother? Um, some people say that he was ill. He, he was suffering from some health problems for all that time, a long time to suffer from health problems. Um, it could be, my theory is at least partially that, and people don't realize that there was a really major change of, of style about 1830 in opera throughout Europe. All of a sudden, there would have been um, tragic endings instead of happy marriages. There would have been supernatural elements instead of rationalist presentation. Um, the role of the tenor was different. Um, the tenor voice was different, and he may have just said, I don't want to deal with change, so um, I'll just quit. But nobody really knows for sure. Anything anyone tells you is only a theory. Um, <coughs> uh, um, so he, he continued to write music, but most of it was um, small vocal pieces, and he wrote a lot of sacred music during this time. Sometimes you'll hear people say that he, he almost quit composing entirely, but that's absolutely not true. He composed continuously, but it just wasn't an opera. Um, he had a lot of troubles financially because there was a change of regime, uh, but eventually he did get the money that he was supposed to get from the French government uh, as a composer at the Opéra. Um, sometimes he moved back to Italy. Uh, he was sent to Bologna for many years. Um, his wife died, um, although by the time she died in 1845, she had uh, long been replaced by this woman, Bonne Félicie who was his mistress um, before his wife died. Remember, they did have an unhappy marriage. Um, there are, of course, um, detriments. There's a detrimental side to being very popular and successful, which is that you elicit envy, jealousy, resentment. And um, an example of that is this caricature that appeared in, in, in a, um, a French journal about 1830. And um, he has two, he has, in one hand, he has a big money bag. The, the sign says France which just means fees, in, in reference to his enormous fees as an opera composer. Mm -hmm. And the chief of music, I'm sure you can't read it from there, but it says, musique facile. <laughs> simple, <laughs> simple music, <laughs> which is, again, a, a denigration of his, his, his charming, delightful, but some people thought frivolous way of, of writing opera. And how it's unfair that someone who wrote so frivolously could make so much money. <clears throat> Not my opinion. <clears throat> Um, at the end of his life, um, he returned to Paris mainly in hopes of seeking better medical treatment. Uh, but uh, there was also a problem because he was unpopular there uh, uh, politically. They didn't feel that he was supporting the liberal movement sufficiently. Um, here's a picture of him about 1850 that's not often seen. And um, when he did get to Paris, he did have a complete physical and emotional rejuvenation after all those years of sickness. And, he began to pre preside over a brilliant senate. That means just informal gatherings of, of wealthy people, also of uh, prominent intellectuals and musicians. And he was famed all over the city for being the most charming host. He had, had a natural amiability, also a natural modesty, which I always admire. I love it when the geniuses are modest. <laughs> of their work. Um, but after his move uh, to Paris, he also began to compose again. And the most famous compositions from the period are the, the Peche de Vies, um, the Sins of Old Age, which are piano pieces and some have voice. Um, sins is a good word for us here. They're not that good. I'm sorry. Just, you don't hear that much because it's just like, So I guess Sins is something um, And <clears throat> then he died wealthy um, at his village in Passy near Paris in 1868. This is uh, one of the last pictures of him that, that still survives. And I think after that, we'll just, we'll just have our set. Oh, we'll see. So that's just a quick introduction to his life. And um, I do give you um, a complete list of all of his operas. And I tell you, look at all of those operas. There are 39 of them. Most people don't. Um, realize how many that were written and in such a short amount of time because he, he was in his period of activities only 19 years. And that time he wrote 39 authors. Most of them, though, were not successful even in their own time. 
And there have been just a few of them that have filtered through and become standard repertory items. And I have listed those at the end. And I've also told you and drawn attention to the most popular opera overtures, which are the delight of orchestral audiences all over the world. They're almost heard too much, in fact. Um, there, as far as the stories and the basic styles, there is a basic dichotomy between comic and serious operas by him. And you can tell just by the titles if they're going to be comic or serious. If, it, if it's um, serious, it does have a high-flown kind of title with fancy character names, um, such as Demetrius, Epilidio. So you know that's going to be, that's going to be serious. But if you have something silly, like, um, <laughs> The sun by accident. <laughs> if you have if you have a silly kind of time like that, of course you know it's going to be common. The um, the serious operas are typic typically sent in the distant past, centuries if not millennia in the past. They're almost never in the in the present. Um, the comic operas, those are the operas of the here and now. Those, those are always have contemporary settings. Um, doesn't matter if it's serious or comic, they all end with happy narratives. <laughs> the whole thing, remember, opera is a love story. Opera is a love story. And depending on the period and the composer, you can always make generalizations about what will happen. Um, in this period, um, at the start, there, there's a couple that belongs together. But they can be. They can be. For some um, dilemma or difficulty, but by the end of the opera, the difficulty clears, and then they get to be together. Then there was a major shift in taste about the year 1830. Then the operas were about a couple who belongs together, but they can't be. And they never get to be. And usually, at least one of the partners has to die, if not both of them. And that's what endured until the end of the, age of the great age of Italian opera, up to and including Puccini. <coughs> I'm so grateful that there was a, a change of taste at the time of the French Revolutions, where they they um, they uh, condensed the action to only one couple that you have to worry about, because in the 18th century it was usually two that you have to worry about. <laughs> but fortunately, in Rossini's time, it was only one, which is a marvelous concentration. There are also some um, operas that mix the action. There is both serious and um, <clears throat> and comic. Those also have happy endings with happy marriages. And in a case like that, you would have a contemporary setting, which is not one in the distant past. Um, our opera, La Cenerentola, is one of three well-known comic operas, and it really is the last of its type for Rossini, interestingly enough. He never again wrote um, an extended comic opera for the rest of his life. It's his, it's his last word. Um, at the age of 25, he never wrote any more. There was a one-act farsa, one more, that was uh, very obscure. It was performed in Lisbon in 1825. And there were still some mixed action operas that he had. But there was no standard opera pufa, as they're called, after Cenerentola. And it is indeed a very, musically, a very sophisticated example. It, it is a, a fitting finale to his work with this style. Uh, it dropped out of the standard repertory. Um, as incredible as that seems now to audiences who see it today. Um, when it first came out, it was more popular than the Barber of Seville. And throughout the 19th century, it was frequently performed, but it just quit being performed. And um, then it was revived uh, in the 20th century, uh, starting in the 1960s. And uh, it became a notable success. It's, it's now one of the most frequently performed operas uh, by any composer. And there are a number of different things that we can point to to explain this. One is that there was a general revival of Rossini's style of writing, which is known as bel canto, in the 1960s, and the emergence of excellent singers um, who specialized in it. One of them just died, and that was, of course, Joan Sutherland, which, um, terrible loss, terrible loss to the world of music. And another great one is Marilyn Horne, who is still alive, but not seen. Um, as you probably know, this house, the Minnesota Opera, is devoted to reviving this repertory, the repertory of the Bel Canto Opera. Um, another reason I think this um, started to become popular is because the story is so well known and it's so beloved. And there were some popular dra dramatizations that appeared about this time that received a lot of attention. One was the Disney movie that came out in 1950. Um, that is now considered one of the great classics, deservedly so. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful film animation version of the Cinderella story. 